This video is about a study called Teens Motivations to Spread Fake News on WhatsApp. And so this is getting at one of the key issues in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and before and after the pandemic, which is the spread of false information and the negative effects it can have on people's understanding of the world and also how they kind of relate with other people. Uh, so fake news can negatively affect social solidarity, can negatively affect uh, how we relate to each other, as well as practical things like understanding what actually works, for example, to protect you from the pandemic and why. So this is the range of topics that I'll be covering in this uh, video about the study. Basically, we'll be talking about fake news and this, this kind of phenomenon that's called fake news. Uh, briefly discussing WhatsApp as one of the most common mechanisms, of a kind of messaging, instant messaging platform, which is one of the ways that this kind of thing spreads very rapidly through group chats uh, and through uh, existing social contacts. Uh, then I'll be talking about media literacy and critical thinking, which are some of the key aspects um, and key ideas for how we can combat the effects of fake news. And then I'll be talking about this particular study, uh, the objectives, methods, and results of this particular study, and then we'll look at the conclusions and implications. So first, the, the question of fake news. What is fake news? Um, it's been defined as an information disorder with different formal characteristics and intentions. Um, basically, it's false information dressed up as if it was real. And I'm actually going to read the abstract here just to kind of um, give the overview of this particular study. So this study, uh, which had, as you can see, three co-authors, uh, it found it, the, the abstract uh, starts by saying, Younger people are exposed to misinformation that circulates rapidly on their mobile devices through instant messaging applications such as WhatsApp. And the messaging applications can be different in different countries. WhatsApp is just a particular prevalent one uh, in the location where they were conducting this study, which was in Spain. Under the guise of news, an attractive format and outraged discourse, fake news appeals to young people's emotions by inviting them to distribute the content impulsively. All of this is supported by a device, the mobile phone, in which the action of sharing is a matter of trust. Therefore, young people are less likely to check a piece of content before resending it if it comes from a contact in their personal address book. To understand young people's habits when receiving informative content through WhatsApp, and the reasons why they choose to share it or not, this study designed a questionnaire on student habits for sharing fake news on the mobile to measure young teenagers' exposure to fake news and their behavior. Empirical data from a sample of 480 adolescents confirmed that one, these adolescents are more likely to share content if it connects with their interests, regardless of its truthfulness, two, trust affects the credibility of information. And three, the appearance of newsworthy information ensures that regardless of the actual accuracy of the content, it is more likely to be shared. So the visual appearance of the item being shared is, is very important. So this was published uh, in the July to September issue 2020 of uh, Social Media and Society, which is a, a uh, social, one of the leading social science journals looking at issues around social media and social media audiences. So let's continue on this theme of fake news. So fake news is defined, um, as I mentioned before, as this kind of information disorder with different formal characteristics and intentions. There are different mm, kind of models for fake news, though. Uh, it can take different forms. So it can be uh, taking the form of satire or parody. Um, so that's a kind of more longstanding form of fake news that's, um, that, that has long played a role in the, the kind of ecosystem of news. 
Uh, it can draw false connections. It can provide misleading content. It can provide false context to kind of change the interpretation of real content. Um, it can bring like add individuals who don't belong into a scene or into a story uh, in there. And it can manipulate content. Uh, these are all different forms of fake news and they have different implications. So fake news can also take the form of fabric fabricated content. So just whole on fake produced um, content. Uh, it can take the form of clickbait where something's very much exaggerated um, to the point of, uh, of falsification in order to get people to click on a, on a story to make the, the producer of the fake news money. Uh, and then it can also take the form of propaganda, which is obviously a longstanding form of fake news um, that goes way back in, in human history uh, where uh, I basically fake information and fake news is provided in order to support those in power in order to, to help them to stay in power and to kind of keep the population in the dark about what's going on in the world that might make the government look bad. So this is something that's, um, I mean, famously during World War II, both the uh, West, uh, the, the United States, the, the, the allied powers, and the Nazis and the Japanese, they, they were all fully involved in, in promoting fake news and propaganda uh, in order to mobilize the population against the enemy. So now we're gonna look in particular at this issue of fake news and teenagers. So the reason the study focused on teenagers is that there is higher exposure to fake news content amongst uh, younger people. So um, younger people are accessing this kind of information on social media to a higher extent, to a greater extent, more frequently. And so they have this higher exposure. They may have a special vulnerability to this kind of information uh, due to less uh, media literacy, which we'll talk about later. Um, and because social media is so important as a source of information, uh, this is uh, particularly a concern with, with teenagers. Also, uh, because secondary sources, so information from other people in their social networks uh, are particularly valued sources of information. This also makes young people more vulnerable to fake news um, and the kind of activation of their emotional response can be conflated with accuracy. Uh, that's what the existing research indicates. So things to counteract media literacy. So one of the long standing concepts about how we counteract, how we fight um, fake news and other forms of specious in, inaccurate information is through schooling, through um, what's called media literacy, um, which is basically training kids um, and adolescents to understand how you can tell whether information is true or not, or whether it's more likely to be true. So this is helping them to assess the credibility of different sources, helping them to think about what is the source trying to do. So they're kind of able to see the purpose behind the, um, the communication. Uh, so this kind of training basically inoculates people and prepares them for this onslaught of false information and attempts to manipulate them that they will encounter for their whole lives as, um, as consumers of news and, uh, and information in general, because uh, a lot of times this kind of information comes through uh, when people are not explicitly looking for news. It's just shared as like, this is what's happening. This is information. So ways to uh, counteract uh, this kind of fake news. This is something that's still kind of a live issue, looking at the most effective ways to counteract fake news. And there are a number of limitations in uh, the effectiveness of media literacy training um, and in general, this is quite a challenge that's, uh, that's been faced by educators for a number of years now and is still ongoing. So now let's think about WhatsApp. So WhatsApp is an example of a wider category of instant messaging services. 
And basically these have kind of direct communication capacities. So that's the default is person to person communication. Uh, but they also have the potential for group communication. They're instant, they are not, um, they're not curated. So the information that is shared on WhatsApp is not curated. It is kind of editorial free and that increases its potential as a way to rapidly spread uh, fake news as well as um, useful information as well. So uh, WhatsApp and other forms of instant messaging service have um, this kind of um, addictive quality that, that has been um, kind of programmed into it or uh, attempted to program into it, a kind of way of making you feel like, oh, I need to check that message. So like the buzz, the, um, the, um, the kind of notifications are designed to kind of keep people stimulated and going back and accessing their messaging service. It's, um, it's got a lot of potential and value that people find in this kind of messaging service as a tool for self-expression, a tool for staying in touch um, across um, different locations. Uh, but it also has potential to harass people um, and to, um, to kind of promote different kinds of misunderstandings um, because of the, that you have less cues normally in something like an instant messaging service than you do from face-to-face communication. So uh, in some ways there's greater potential for conflict. But basically this kind of instant messaging service is used to establish relationships, maintain relationships, uh, construct uh, identities, and uh, to share information. So if we look at the combination of fake news and an instant messaging service like WhatsApp, uh, we can see that there's a lot of potential for fake information, fake visuals to spread through something like WhatsApp because there's no mechanism to stop it. There's no, um, there's no technical mechanism. There's no editorial role. Uh, so basically anything can be shared and that sharing is only mediated by the individual. So it's only um, cognitive control mechanisms that would be at play here, basically the the thinking mechanisms of the user. And the uh, one of the research findings is that those thinking mechanisms can be deactivated. Uh, so the kind of controls that you might put on saying like, oh, this, this might not be true. If you keep getting positively reinforced for publishing content. So if you're posting content that aligns with the interests or the beliefs of the people you're posting it to, and that gets a positive reception because of that, then you're going to keep doing it even if it's fake or false information because, because of the reinforcement. So now let's think about the combination of media literacy and critical thinking. These are two concepts that very much go together. So media literacy is about uh, kind of developing the ability to use information in a way that um, that is kind of applying critical thinking to to media content. Uh, the concern is that uh, about media literacy as a solution uh, for things like fake news is that it's putting the onus onto the user. So the the individual has to prepare themselves, has to make themselves as an individual uh, more resilient to this kind of fake news and information. Uh, as opposed to placing the responsibility onto those uh, involved in producing the content onto the media platforms, the social media platforms, uh, which is a more realistic structural focus in terms of uh, changing things. Of course, the reality is that it needs to be both. Um, any kind of top-down mechanism for, um, for addressing fake news and similar kinds of issues is only going to be imperfect. It's never gonna catch everything. And so you also need to develop in the citizenry a kind of capacity uh, to be resilient to false information, to the spread of misinformation, uh, and also to not participate in the spread of, of misinformation. Um, so in, in practice, both are clearly necessary. So critical thinking is the capacity to critically analyze the information that you're obtaining. And this is something that can be developed through, um, through training, through education, 
Um, it involves reading carefully, uh, the ability to discuss, debate, and look at why things are the way they are. So the, uh, the question, one of the questions that the, that's kind of critical to this issue is can this kind of critical thinking be applied outside of the classroom context um, in, in the scenario where uh, people are encountering information where they should be applying critical thinking? How do you encourage that? Uh, how do you make that happen so that people really do use, develop and then use their critical thinking capacity in a context like sharing misinformation? So now let's look at the specific study here. So this particular study um, was looking, as I mentioned, at teenagers and the spread of mis uh, spread of information through through WhatsApp. Objective one of the study was to learn about teenagers' habits um, and what they do basically when they receive informative content through WhatsApp. And the first hypothesis is that there are differences in habits depending on the nature of the digital content received. So this is kind of an optimistic hypothesis that um, that people will be able to distinguish. They will distinguish between reliable content and misinformation. Objective two was to learn why teenagers choose to share informational content received through WhatsApp. And here the hypothesis is that there are differences in the reasons why teenagers choose to forward informa informative content through WhatsApp, depending on the nature of the digital content received, reliable content and misinformation. So this is um, thinking that there will be differences in rationale for the decision to share, depending on the content that they're exposed to. So this study uh, looked at a sample of 480 teenagers aged 14 to 18 with a, an average age of 16. Uh, it was conducted in south of Spain in the, the city of Seville, Sevilla. And um, the sample was um, pretty close to e even split between male and female. So they provided four different cases here that they included in the study. So one was genuine news, one was clickbait, so kind of exaggerated, uh, shocking information to try to um, basically trick people into clicking on a topic. Um, one is parody, so this is um, when fake news is presented, it basically it's a joke, um, like The Onion does, uh, has long done, um, and out outright fake news. And then there was this questionnaire on students' habits for sharing fake news through mobile phones. So teenagers are exposed to the fake news. Uh, they then kind of do some kind of sharing or evaluation behavior. And then the study looked at what happened. So uh, in the survey, they asked young people, their, their participants, um, about whether what they did. So do they um, forward without looking at the content? Do they forward once they've seen the content? Do they uh, delete the link because they think it's not interesting to share it? Do they delete, delete it because they don't trust the person who shared it? Uh, do they delete because they don't trust the information itself? So uh, these were the results. Um, you can see here with uh, the more prevalent uh, response being the higher number. So uh, the biggest categories were forward after they've seen the content uh, or deleting content because they didn't think it was interesting. So here are the results. Uh, the, the four different cases, uh, we're looking at the, the results for how people felt about the the four different cases. So the delete the link because you don't think it's interesting was much more common with clickbait. So they were basically just not sold on the clickbait and they deleted it. Um, and then the appearance of the information they found was very much associated with likelihood to share. So regardless of the content, if it looked like news, really it looked credible, 
then it was more likely to be shared. And they, they were not distinguishing between real news or fake news. If it had the kind of headline and image looked like a news story, then it was more likely to get shared. In terms of reasons for sharing informative content on WhatsApp, uh, the first, the most common was to inform others. The next was because they found it interesting themselves. Uh, next for entertainment and then next for popularity, basically to get um, other people to like them. So um, this is interesting that information related reasons are so common and that they say that popularity is not a major motivation for sharing information that was not expected in the study. So when we look at the comparison between those four different types of new uh, fake news, uh, news, clickbait, parody, and fake, so uh, real news and then three different types of, um, of fake news, um, these are the different findings in terms of reasons to share. So for real news, the most common, uh, this was most commonly associated with an entertainment motivation. Uh, for popularity, there were no significant differences. It was um, just not a major driver, uh, according to the respondents. Uh, finding the news interesting, uh, that came up most often with real news as um, in terms of a motivation. And then informing others was most often, uh, it was a tie with both real news and fake news. So uh, people keen to inform others as their motivation, uh, they were equally, equally likely to share uh, real news and fake news. So the conclusion here is that fake news is shared because it is successfully camouflaging itself as real information. So the, the false information, uh, having the appearance of real information is, is enough. Teenagers were not able to tell the difference between real and false information. And so it was purely based on the appearance and structure of the news, uh, just aesthetic dimensions. So this highlights the power of fake news and shows that teens are indeed vulnerable to fake news that's kind of pretending to be real news uh, visually. So this clearly connects up with uh, the study that we're doing in Germany called Viral Communication, Public Responses to the COVID-19 Pandemic where uh, we're very interested in the phenomenon of how does information or misinformation get shared and why and what are the motivations. So we can see uh, in, in the study that we're doing, uh, what are the patterns of COVID-19 related misinformation? Why are people sharing them? What are their motivations? Um, are they motivated because it's interesting, uh, because they want to inform others? And can we predict differences in sharing practices and um, kind of effects on people's own behavior based on what their motivations were for sharing or accessing information or misinformation?